Welcome back to this part two of Murder with Friends. Today we're discussing Jack the Ripper. And in this second part, I wanna talk a little bit about the evidence that sticks out to us, a little bit about the victimology. And then in part three, we will be moving on to some suspects, some different theories that we find interesting. Now. Jen, I know yes, that we really had to fly through all the details of the the victims and what went down and yeah. when in part one. But let's let's broaden our discussion a little bit. Who okay. were these women that were being hunted by Jack the Ripper? They were mostly women who had some form of a day job, um, as far as I know. They, mm -hmm. I think, uh, Catherine Eddowes did a lot of sewing and she made some kind of table linen. I forget mm -hmm. exactly what it was, but I heard someone call them casual prostitutes. Right. Um, so they just used prostitution as supplemental income. So they had to have led relatively normal lives by day. But they and were then, poor. Yeah. These were very poor women. If they were working poor, they were still living in lodging houses exactly. that were just absolutely overflowing. Th these are high risk women. Um, a, a large portion of them, I don't know if this means anything, were wearing black at the time that they were be, that they were killed. Interesting. Um, these were women who were out late at night, very late at night, um, and a lot of them were prostitutes and just very uh, at risk individuals. Now let's get into a little bit of the evidence. And unfortunately, there it's it's hard it to find much. a concrete piece of evidence that everyone can agree on. This is from Jack the Ripper, this is what this means. Um, so let's first go to Mick Priestley, the author of One Autumn in Whitechapel, on some evidence that sticks out to him. I think a piece of evidence that stands out to me as being important, and was seen as being very important to investigators at the time, is the constant recurring theme of fake coins appearing at the crime scenes and being re regularly involved throughout the case. At the at the murder sites of Alice McKenzie and Annie Chapman, investigators reported that there were these strange coins found beneath the body and beside the body that had been polished brightly, and it was the opinion of the police that they'd been passed off by the murderer to the victim as coins of a higher value in order to entice her to, to the spot where he wanted her to go. This would appear to be a part of the killer's MO, and there were other women in the area who also reported meeting a strange man in the Whitechapel and Spitalfields area who would entice them with these coins in the same sort of way. They said the man had approached them in the street, offered them money to go with them to a secluded spot, and when they were there, he'd attack them. He'd hit them in the face, he'd attempted to strangle them, he'd pulled a blade, all of these kind of things, but she then struggled with him, screamed, maybe hit him, scared him away, and only once the man had gone did she realize that these coins that he'd given her had been polished brightly and machined around the edges, it was said to be to appear that they were more valuable than they really were it would appear therefore that the killer might actually have used the ruse of meeting women in the street, giving them these fake coins to go with them to this spot, and only when he's lured them to that spot is he then going to attack. Other victims in the case were found with no money on them at all at the crime scene. So if the killer had actually offered them money to go to a spot with them, which would seem he surely must have, it would appear that he must have taken this money back with him before he fled the scene. Another thing that is important, but people often tend to overlook for some reason, is the constant appearance of signature factors at the Jack the Ripper crime scenes. Now, a signature factor is a unique and repetitive characteristic at a crime scene that are seen to be above and beyond what is necessarily to sim necessary to simply commit the murder and unique to each offender as they fit in with the offender's own private sexual fantasies. For example, the Jack the Ripper victims, pretty much without exception, were found on the back with a head to the side, with the eyes wide open, hand across the chest, blood smeared across them. He'd taken the hats off the heads and placed them on the ground beside them. The legs were apart, the clothes were pulled up, objects were arranged around the body. These are factors at the crime scene that the killer feels he needs to act out in order to feel fully sexually gratified from his offense. But to do this, it would also necessitate that he spends more time at the crime scene, increasing his risk of capture, increased, increasing his risk of leaving more evidence or perhaps being seen. And the fact that he, he feels the need to do this in spite of these dangers shows that he, they were so important to him that his desire to commit these extra extra acts outweighed his better judgment and his worries of getting caught. Also, his apparent disregard to the risk he was taking in a modern case would also imply to investigators that he might have been mentally ill, he might have been drunk, or he might have been on drugs. You'll never see in a documentary anybody suggesting that Jack the, Rip Jack the Ripper was drunk or on drugs at the time of the offenses, but in a modern case, it would be suggested that he almost certainly must have been. Something I really like about Mick and his approach to studying Jack the Ripper is he really does 
take a modern eye to an old, old case that sort of feels tired and old. And it is, you, you do wonder about how these murders were so violently committed and the obvious stamp that Jack Ripper had on his victims, that is obviously him leaving his, his marks. He tells us so much about himself in the way that he mutilated these bodies. Um, and quickly, as and you mentioned so earlier, so incredibly I mean, so quickly. quickly. And without the precision of, it, it's not a surgical hand that was at work here. This is, you know, this is a grim ripping. This is a slashing motion. This isn't, you know, I'm going to take out a little scalpel here. I mean, when you can just look at the photos, you can look at the sketches at the time and know that that isn't true. So it's weird how these falsehoods are have been perpetuated throughout time as just true. And if you repeat a lie enough, it becomes true. And I think that's what we see with Jack the Ripper. And that's one of the things that. Uh, fascinated me about his first video that we watched was that the first thing he says was, or one of the first things is um, he's often described as having medical expertise. And that's something that I've heard so often that in my brain until I sat down in this chair, I was like, oh yeah, it's medical something or another. And I didn't realize that that was just something I'd heard that mm -hmm. stuck with me and not Truth. Yeah, that it was a doctor running around Whitechapel with a briefcase. It's just, yeah. there's no basis it's of that. It's just been repeated enough that yeah. It's become considered truth. And there's another uh, there's another piece of evidence that a lot of people will point to that I think we do also have to throw out as a hoax, which again, I know sort of leaves us in the mud because then what evidence do we have? But I'm referring to the letter, the Dear Boss letter that was sent on September 27th in 1888. So this would come right before the killing of Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes. Um, I'm sorry if I was saying Endos in part one, my bad. Um, basically this letter, he names himself. He says, I'm Jack the Ripper. And and it's all, he's saying that he's gonna take a piece of the next victim's ear. And so a lot of people felt that this was true because there were pieces missing of Catherine Eddowes' ear. And in fact, this, this did end up mostly being regarded as a hoax. The letter also disappeared and then resurfaced in 1987. It's, it's very peculiar how uh, this got picked up as fact again. Well, I heard that it was, um, they came to the conclusion that it was written by a journalist. A journalist, Who yeah. wanted to drum up more excitement, although I don't know how you make this horrific serial killer. How could it like, be any more How How is exciting? it already not sensational enough? And also, I, I think that even though I throw it out as evidence, I don't believe that Jack the Ripper wrote that letter. Yeah, me either. I think it is uh, an interesting um, moment in a dark side of history because we see a killer uh, giving themselves a name or the media co-opting a name that someone else named this killer. And that would become a theme. We look at uh, BTK named himself as well, uh, the Zodiac. This interaction with authority was initiated really by Jack the Ripper. He was the first, uh, I, I heard a podcast refer to him as the first supervillain, which I, I am inclined to believe is true, although yeah. I do not believe that this correspondence was from Jack the Ripper. One thing I do believe was from Jack the Ripper is the writing on the wall, quite literally the writing on the wall, which yeah. came uh, following the murder of Catherine Eddowes. There was a piece of her uh, apron or her dress that was cut, cut away. And we believe that this was used to wrap the uterus um, and another body part that the killer had taken with him as a souvenir. Um, and then this bloody piece of fabric was dropped. And right around where it was dropped, they saw that was written a message that has been speculated because it was immediately washed away. Um, it said, the Jews will not be blamed for nothing, something along those lines. And uh, the police inspector came and saw it and he said, we have to, we have to wash this away. Yeah, they didn't wanna cause race. Riots. Right, yeah, because because um, this was such an immigrant heavy, rich community in London and that would have certainly, given how tense things already were, that would have certainly caused uh, a riot if people thought that perhaps these murders were somehow um, racially or anti-Semitic in any way, shape or form. But I, I think that this, uh, that that's the piece of evidence for me that I think is interesting that he dropped this piece of cloth. Um, was Catherine Eddowes the one that he took the kidney from that showed up in the From Hell letter? Oh, we'll the, talk about the From Hell letter. I, di I didn't mean to skip your bullet points if you had more no, to No, no, go on. Uh, the From Hell letter really fascinates me because that's the only one that we have sort of a consensus that that did come from mm -hmm. the killer. Um, it was a letter that arrived and uh, 
talked about the eating of a kidney, and uh, it included a piece of kidney, and said, you know, I, I ate the rest of it. It had a lot of misspellings, which I think correlates with the writing. It would on be the a wall. reoccurring theme. For the like bizarre yeah. spellings of the English language, um, but they are pretty sure that it was him, specifically because the piece of kidney that arrived um, showed markers of the same disease that. I think Catherine Eddowes mm -hmm. had, mm -hmm. um, so it was. It, it looked really plausible that yeah, he did take her kidney. He may or may not have eaten part of it and then sent the rest along with a letter. And yeah, a piece of evidence I want to throw out was something that came up sort of recently about a shawl that had maybe belonged to Catherine Eddowes that came up at an auction recently, and uh, it was apparently this shawl had blood of Catherine Eddowes on it and also the semen of Jack the Ripper. And then when they had done one round of not peer reviewed DNA testing, it came back as being the DNA of uh, Kosminski, who would be a suspect that was actually named in the Mac Naughton memoranda. So all of this looked, oh, it really, it worked really well. But uh, when you examine the, the circumstances surrounding the finding of this evidence. It was a very expensive shawl. Catherine Eddowes, as we've talked about, was not, not a wealthy woman. Wealthy. Yeah. Wouldn't have really made sense for her to have that. Also, a, another thing about this was that the police officer who's who passed this shawl down to his family as a as a weird heirloom uh, that then thanks, came up dad. for auction. <laughs> yeah, thanks for this, Dad. Uh, he was not on site at the time, so it's weird that he would somehow have this shawl, even though it is an old shawl. I'm sure that he did have it, and maybe he believed that this, by the way, eight foot shawl was- Eight foot? It was a long that's shawl. That's not a shawl, that's a blanket. Yeah, so that's, it's, that's like, a it's like a, project a hallway a runner. Um, <laughs> Or you know, if uh, if if Jack the Ripper was in possession of this shawl, why would he cut a part of her apron off when he wanted to carry away parts of the, the her parts of her Maybe body? Because he had it this was eight shawl. feet long. Yeah, he was like, I gotta ditch it. I need to be more aerodynamic. I just imagine him wrapping it up and like throwing the entire length of the shawl over his back, like a cartoon and hitchhiker. Like, Sir, what and, is that? Like goes walking off down the train tracks and. Yeah, I, and but that but that's what you sort of come up against when it comes to evidence surrounding Jack the Ripper is yeah. that. On its face, it will look really good. Oh, this was DNA tested. You know, uh, this must be um, this must be it. This has Kosminski's DNA. He's the guy. And then you realize, okay, it's not peer reviewed. Okay, this is the DNA testing that wouldn't actually hold up in court. The doctor who even did the testing said, I wouldn't. You wouldn't be able to convict anyone with the sort of testing that I was doing at the time. It has been heavily contaminated over the years. It was not kept in a clean room. And then you know, then you're shit out of luck again. And but that, <laughs> but you start being like, oh wow, we know who it is because of this shawl. And then you go down another Jack the Ripper rabbit hole, and you're we're not we're not any we're not yeah. any closer. This evidence didn't get us anywhere. But that said, we do have a full list of suspects, and we can't get into all of them. But we're going to get into a few in part three. Stay with us. Thank you.